several announcements. Beginning in May, we'll have Wednesday services. Beginning in May, midweek services will be on Wednesday. So your first Wednesday service will be May 4th. May 4th. May the 4th be with you. Uh, May 4th will be the first Wednesday service. All right. Judges, so we've been going through the book of Judges, and uh, we ended at the life of Jephthah. And, uh, well, we ended after Jephthah had um, promised a vow, and we talked about rash vows and all that. So just to do a little recap, Jephthah had wrought a great victory in chapter 11 over the Ammonites. And he vowed, he said, Lord, I'll, I'll, if you give me this great victory, um, I'll sacrifice the first thing that meets me, whatsoever meets me at the at my gate when I return to what happens, his daughter met him. Um, so we talked about rash vows. We talked about um, that Jephthah didn't even need to vow that vow because the Spirit of God had already come upon him before he even made that vow, saying that God was already going to give him a great victory. Oftentimes, God already had, I mean, he already has all this stuff planned, but we make dumb decisions with our mouth often um, without ever really having to actually do, do that. Um, we put ourselves in, the Bible says it's better to vow, uh, uh, better to not vow than to vow and not pay, right? Um, it's better to keep your mouth shut and people think you're dumb than to open your mouth and remove all doubt, right? That's the saying that I've heard um, before. Um, so personally when it comes to or what I believe happens here in Judges chapter 11 when it says that, um, that Jephthah was going to offer his daughter for sacrifice that he didn't actually offer as a burnt offering because that would go against the Levitical law that would go against God uh, who does not believe in human sacrifice right and so one God would have not honored a human sacrifice Two, the only place he could have offered a burnt offering was at the tabernacle, and there's no way the Levites would have done it because they've been instructed against that in Leviticus 17. What I, what I believe happened, according to this, is that his daughter was given the service of the tabernacle, just like Samuel was dedicated to the tabernacle uh, when he was born. So when we get through all of that, Jephthah's had kind of an up and down, right? His mother was a harlot. He was kicked out of his family. His brothers chased after him. So he's basically a lone man in the middle of nowhere. Children of Israel are now in trouble. And they come calling on the guy that they treated so horrible and saying, hey, we need your help. So he helps them. God delivers them. He makes this out. And now here we are in Judges chapter 12. It says, And the men of Ephraim gathered themselves together and went northward and said unto Jephthah, Well, wherefore pass thou over to fight against the children of Ammon? Didst not call us to go with thee? We'll burn thine house upon thee. Jephthah just rocked to the great victory. The children of Ephraim come by and say, Why didn't you call us to go with you? We don't like you. We're going to burn your house because you didn't ask for our help. And Jephthah said unto them, I and my people were at great strife with the children of Ammon. And when I called you, you delivered me not out of their hands. When I saw that you delivered me not, I put my life in my hands, passed over against the children of Ammon, and the Lord delivered them into my hand. He said, look, I called you. You said you weren't going to help. Well, God did work anyways. <laughs> um, and uh, Jephthah gathered together all the men of Gilead and fought with Ephraim. And the men of Gilead smote Ephraim. So then Gilead and Ephraim start fighting. Here's the thing to think about. When we go, we're only doing these, seven, these first seven verses. Anytime there's a great victory or somebody dedicates themselves to the Lord, there's going to be persecution. Satan's going to come in and he's going to try to disrupt that. Jephthah, you think about it, Jephthah went from nothing to all of a sudden top of the world per se because he had wrought this great victory, but he still uh, honored his vow, that he, he honored his word to the Lord. He said, Lord, I'm going to do this, and, and he kept it. How many times have we made a promise to the Lord or to the church or to something and not done it? Lord, forgive us for that. I don't want to be an Ananias and Sapphira. Um, but anytime there's been a great victory for God or a great commitment made and kept by God's people, Satan's going to come in and try to ruin everything and try to discourage the progress that has been made. 
It seems that in this life, whenever a child of God surrenders to do God's will, in one form or fashion, Satan's going to send somebody in to cast doubt on God's calling, God's direction. Sometimes it comes from your own family. Sometimes it comes from people outside of the church. Oftentimes it comes from people within the church. When I surrender to pre preach, people discouraged it. When I surrendered to become a pastor, people discouraged it. When I told people I was moving out here to become a pastor of this church, people discouraged it. And if the Lord moves us on at some point, guess what? People are going to discourage it. We don't do our... We didn't come out here because we like Jen and Jason. I don't like them that much to move here for them. Right? I do like them. But... When the Lord tells you to do something, you do it. Yeah. Right? Uh, regardless, do what God directs. Regardless, because it has been evident. I've seen it time and time again in my life. And when I've, I've been wholly committed to do something for the Lord, say, God, I believe this is what you want me to do. I'm going to do it. And you go forward for the Lord, guess what? Somebody's not going to like it. Somebody's going to attack it. And you know what? Too many Christians, too many people in church allow themselves to be used of the devil. Right? The devil doesn't need to send his, his demons in here per se because he's already, got, he's already got Christians working for him. So you look in these first three verses, you see the argument that went on. Jephthah's being berated by Ephraim for not asking for help. This is often the result of nothing more than pride. When you look at this, you know what Ephraim was upset about? They weren't going to get the glory. They weren't going to get any kind of recognition for helping. And why did you call us? We want, to be, we want our name to be on that roll. We want our name to be up there saying, look what we did. Ephraim was mad at Jephthah for not asking for the help, yet he had every reason not to. He had done, the Ephraim was not trustworthy. Um, in these verses, we see that Jephthah called on them earlier in his life. They wouldn't help. And you know what? You and I can become Ephraim. You and I can be the same way. You can get angry over not being asked to help when all we've done, all you've done is turn a deaf ear and a blind eye to anybody else that needs help because it doesn't benefit you. Right? Ephraim, that's what they did. It didn't benefit them at the time to help Jephthah. But now that Jephthah is somebody and he's fighting a great victory, guess what happens? Ephraim gets mad. We wanted to be a part of that. You didn't ask us. Why didn't you ask us? Because I don't trust you. Right? You see, the problem with Ephraim's complaint is that they were not able to get the glory of the battles of Jephthah and the men of Gilead. And here's, here's the thing. The men of Gilead, here's the other problem with Ephraim. Ephraim was mad, not only because they didn't get to go to war, but because God used somebody else that they didn't believe should be doing it. I've been, I've been on the receiving end of that that people think that I shouldn't do certain things because, because of who I am. Or because I'm not from the island. Right? So, the Gileadites were not from Israel. The Gileadites, if you remember, they were the people that came in in Joshua chapter number 9 they were so uh, scared of Israel, they respected God so much, they went in, they disguised themselves as being from a very far country. Joshua didn't even consult God, and they accepted these people, and come to find out a few days later, they're at their home. And God told them, don't make an agreement with anybody from this area. This is what happens when you don't follow God, when you don't ask for God's advice, and you don't look for God's will of things to be done, and you only look for What's convenient for you at the time, guess what happens? You're going to end up down the road having some serious problems because you ignored what God told them. God told Israel, don't, don't make an agreement with any of these nations. Well, Gileadites. So now Gilead has been a part of Israel for a long time. God says, you made an agreement with me, you're going to hold that end of the bargain. So Gilead, the Gileadites, they were hewers of wood and drawers of water. Basically, they were the janitors. They were the low-class service. They were the the, I guess you would call it menial labor now, right? They were basically the slaves to the children of Israel. And Ephraim's mad because 
how are you going to win a victory with a bunch of people that don't even belong here? Right? Why do we put limits on who God can use? It's a pride thing for us. God can't. God's not going to do anything with you because you're not from here. Okay. I could really care less what people think. Maybe that's, maybe that's why I'm the way that I am. I want God to be happy, not my neighbor. Amen. Right? <clears throat> so, the lesson here is don't be an Ephraimite. Don't let your pride of not getting recognition cause you to fight with those on the same team as you. Ephraim and Gilead were on the same team. Now we're getting ready to fight each other in verses 4 through 7. So you look at verse number 4. It says, And Jephthah gathered together all the men of Gilead and fought with Ephraim. The men of Gilead smote Ephraim because they said, You Gileadites are fugitives of Ephraim among the Ephraimites and among the Manassites. And the Gileadites took the passages of Jordan before the Ephraimites. And it was so when those Ephraimites, which were escaped, said, Let me go over. That the, so the men of Gilead had on one side, they have this area blocked off, and it's the only way to cross. The men of Gilead said, I'm marked out Ephraimite. And if he said no, nay, then they said unto him, Say now Shibboleth. And he said, Sibboleth, for he could not frame to pronounce it right. Then they took him and slew him at the passages of Jordan, and there fell at the time of Ephraimites forty and two thousand. Jephthah judged Israel six years, then died Jephthah the Gileadite, and was buried in one of the cities of Gilead. This is a simple but effective means of rooting out fakes. Okay? So they got the enemy on one side, you got, you got the Ephraimites on one side, you got the Gileadites blocking a very strategic passageway. And the Ephraimites trying to escape would come through, and basically you had guards there saying, All right, are you an Ephraimite? And they would say, No, not at all. What are you guys? All right, say Shibboleth. And they would say, Sibboleth. It's a dialect thing. They couldn't pronounce it right. So it immediately gave them away. Their speech gave them away. This is the whole point of this message here. Jephthah was able to determine who was on what side based on their dialect. You know what? I can tell somebody from Michigan versus somebody from where I grew up. Mm -hmm. You guys add S's to everything. Yeah. Some of them <laughs> talk through their nose. But Pastor Gibbs wife from Chicago. The shoes looked all over. She still has a Chicago accent. Yeah. My sister has lived in like 15 different places. But she lived a good portion of her life in South Carolina. She can get into a really thick country accent. <laughs> uh, you can generally tell what part of the country somebody's from. Mm -hmm. You guys remember when Brother Jeremy Ingalls came in? He's from Wisconsin. And I remember Joy telling me, Pastor, we didn't need an interpreter for him. We needed one for you. <laughs> so Jephthah was able to tell by their speech. This, there, there's a deep practical truth here as well. Your speech will eventually out you. Yeah. You claim to be a, a child of God, your speech probably says otherwise. Speech reveals the real you. Look at Matthew chapter number 7. Matthew chapter number 7. I just might be able to get all of this in. Matthew chapter number 7. The way that Jephthah was able to keep enemies from infiltrating was by their speech. Same thing here. You let somebody sit in this church long enough. You, you're around somebody long enough. Guess what? You're going to know where they stand, where they're from. I can try to hide a southern accent all I want. You may not pick up on it for a little while. But if I... I may say certain things. Like, hey, how are you? A lot of people don't say hey. Hey is for horses. <laughs> we're going to say hey. Hey, we're going to have some, what kind of pie? Pecan. She says pecan pie. I say pecan. Right? Pecan. You guys, that's because you're from up here. You guys call it pop. The only thing that goes pop is the, the only thing that goes pop is a weasel. I call it Coke. It's you ask me what kind of Coke I want, I tell you Mountain Dew, mm -hmm. right? You ask me what kind of Coke I want, I tell you Pepsi or whatever, but only, only people north of Mason Dixon line drink Pepsi. Anyways, your speech 
gives you away. You can sound and look the Christian every Sunday morning or every Thursday night or every service, but as soon as you get out into the world, you get around other people, guess what? Your speech will give you away. Matthew chapter number 7, verse number 14, the Bible says this. I got the wrong one, Pastor. Anyways, guess we ain't going there. What your speech reveals the real you. Um, Proverbs 23, 7 says this, For as he thinketh in his heart, so is he. Eat and drink, saith he, but his heart is not with thee. It's what comes in, in you does not defile you. It's what comes out of you. That's the passage of Matthew I was looking for. What comes in you doesn't defile you. What comes out of here is what defiles us. Uh, look at Matthew chapter 26. Here's a prime example of this. Matthew chapter 26. Look at verse number 69. Prime example of your speech giving you away. It can do one of two things. You act like a Christian and talk like a Christian around the pastor. Or around people from church. But in your job or your vacation or your family or whatever it is, guess what the real you is going to come out? But if, but if you're genuine, guess what? People are going to know that they can trust you. People are going to know that your, your, your speech is real. And they'll be more, they'll be closer to you. So, Matthew 26, verse 69. Now Peter sat without in the palace after Jesus is Jesus getting ready to get crucified. Uh, he's in the judgment. Peter sat without in the palace, and a damsel came to him and saying, Thou also was with Jesus of Galilee. But he denied before them all, saying, I know not what thou sayest. And when he was gone out into the porch, another maid saw him and said unto them that were there, This fellow was also with Jesus of Nazareth. And again he denied with an oath, I don't know, I do not know the man. And after a while came unto him that stood by and said to Peter, Surely thou art one of them, for thy speech bewrayeth thee. They said, well, Your speech says that you've been with Jesus. Are people are going to be able to notice that you've been with Jesus based on your speech? Or are you going to have to come up do the opposite of what Peter did? Here, then Peter, trying to distance himself from everything, began to curse and to swear, saying, I know not the man immediately the cock broke. Speech gave it away. So what kind of speech are we to have? Go to Colossians chapter number 4. How are you supposed, supposed to speak? Yes, the Bible speaks on, teaches on what you're supposed to speak, what you're supposed to wear, how you're supposed to cut your hair, and all that. But you know what? Christians don't want to follow it because it goes against what they want to do. Colossians. Colossians chapter number 4, verse number 6, Colossians 4, 6, let your speech be always with grace. That means before you say something, you know that somebody else isn't as perfect as you. Because, <laughs> you know, we're perfect. We all, we all, we judge everybody based on off what we are, Right? Let your speech be always with grace, seasoned with salt, that you may know how you ought to answer every man. Seasoned with salt. You know what salt does? It preserves. You know what, you know what your speech should do? It should lift somebody up rather than tear them down. It should encourage. It should cause something to last a little bit longer than to destroy things. Uh, go to Titus chapter number 2. Titus chapter number 2. Thy speech berateth thee, right? Titus chapter number 2. Verse number 7. It says, In all things showing thyself a pattern of good works, and doctrine showing uncorruptness, gravity, uh, which is, you know, being having a serious course to life, sincerity. What's the next phrase? Sound speech that cannot be condemned. 
That's the kind of speech we're supposed to have. We should be able to speak and people not be able to hold anything against it. If people are scared to tell you something, it's probably because they're afraid you'll tell somebody else. Right? People shouldn't, I, I remember as a kid being scared to go talk to certain people because I knew as soon as I said something to them, they'd either come at me rather than pull me aside and, you know, have grace. It just, whoa, a mouth tornado, I don't know, whatever you want to call it. Open up their mouth and the flies of hell come out. All right, sound speech that cannot be condemned, that he that is a contrary part may be ashamed of having no evil thing to say of you. You know what the Christian is supposed to do? Live every aspect of their life so no one can say anything negative about them. Yeah. Why? Because if you say you're a Christian, you're a representative of Jesus Christ. Yeah. And so if they look at my wife and they can say all this bad stuff about my wife, and it's true, then guess what? They're saying it about Jesus. Your speech reveals the real you. Oh, we can put on a good front. But what's really... Politicians do this all the time, right? Politician, get up a year before their <laughs> election. They talk all this wonderful game, yeah. talk all these promises, and then they get in and do absolutely the opposite, right? Yeah. But Christians are, the, Christians are the exact same way. Yeah. On Sunday... Pastor, pray for this person I witnessed to. When in reality, they didn't even witness to him. They just invited him to church. I'm sorry, inviting somebody to church is not witnessing to him. Mm -hmm. Oh, it's great. Invite people to church, please. But that doesn't constitute you witnessing and fulfilling the great commission. All right. Um, go to Matthew chapter 12. Matthew chapter 12. We're all stuck here. Matthew chapter number 12. Don't worry, I'll get you out before too long. I know there's plenty of more important things in church. <laughs> Matthew chapter number 12. Uh, I say that very tongue-in-cheek. Verse number 34. Matthew 12, 34. Jesus says, O generation of vipers, how can ye, being evil, speak good things? For out of the abundance of the heart the mouth speaketh. I don't care what kind of front you put on, like I said, your speech is going to reveal the real you, give it a certain amount of time. Because what's in here comes up here. Um, a good man, verse 35, out of the good treasure of his heart bringeth forth good things. And an evil man out of the evil treasure of his heart bringeth forth or out, of, out of the evil treasure bringeth forth evil things. But I say to you that every idle word, that every single word that men shall speak, they shall give account thereof in the day of judgment. For by thy words thou shalt be justified, and by thy words thou shalt be condemned. The way, here's how we approach speech as Christians and children of God. Is what I'm saying, uplifting Christ. That's what it boils down to. Does this build uplift Christ or not? Is this, you know, they, there was a saying, there's a killer, right? Um, think about what you're going to say before you speak, right? I used to get told that all the time. Mm -hmm. If we would just actually stop before we mm -hmm. do a, a word throw up, people would probably trust us more. They would probably have more friends. Uh, everything in life is affected by this. That's why James dedicates so much time to it. That's why Jesus dedicates time to it. Here's a conclusion of it. Don't let your speech be the reason God strikes you down. You look back in Judges chapter 12. But Judges chapter 12. We'll go right back there. Many times that the Lord wanted to kill the children of Israel was what? Their speech. Because the Bible talks about them murmuring. You know what murmuring is? It's a very subtle. It's, it's not a, 
a straight up loud out complaint. It's a getting everybody against the pastor, right? Or getting everybody against Moses. You know why God threw, gave, uh, gave Miriam leprosy? Because of her tongue. You know why God killed Nadab and Abihu? Split open the ground and swallowed all their family? Because of their tongue. But where does it all start? It starts in the heart. Judges chapter 12. Then say, verse number 6, Then said they unto him, Say now Shibboleth. And he said, Sibboleth, for he could not frame to pronounce it right. Then they took and slew him at the passages of Jordan. There fell at the time of the, uh, of the Ephraimites 42,000. 42,000 people died because they couldn't speak right. <laughs> Here's the thing. Don't let, the, don't let your speech be the reason God gets rid of you or strikes you down because you're bringing a reproach to his name. And so we all need to look in the mirror every day. How was my speech bereaved me? How does the speech, what I said last week, does it bring unification to the body of Christ? Does what I say yesterday uplift the Lord? Does what I say yesterday encourage another person to live for the Lord? Or does it cause him distress? He may not, God may not strike you dead. But he may make you miserable. You'll become angry. You'll be untrustworthy. In lack of friends because you destroyed everything with the lips that God created. Think about this. God made these. He made our speech. Why not let him, you, why not use them for his honor and glory? To build it. You know what Christ did? He created this. He didn't destroy this. He created this. So let's build things with it. Let your speech be unreproachable. Uncondemnable, profitable. How about just being kind? And you know what? The Bible says you should always be ready to give a reason of the hope that lies within you. To be able to answer every man of the reason of the hope that lies within you. If your mouth is so, so full of bitterness and gossip, it's going to be a mouth that will not be able to get the gospel out. If your mouth is full of garbage, the Holy Spirit's got no room to use it. So if we keep it clean... If we brush it with the Word of God and with the Spirit of God, guess what's going to happen? We're going to have speech that is sweet and profitable. Um, so, with that, Shibboleth versus Sibboleth. Your speech reveals who you are. Jason, would you close more prayer? Dear Lord, thank you for an opportunity we have to gather together, Lord, and hear preaching and teaching from the Lord. Lord, we ask that as we go out the rest of the week, Lord, that you give us a good week and help us to be a witness for you. Lord, bring us back on Sunday and for a good church service and a good time and good fellowship, Lord. We ask all this in your name. Amen. Amen.